Well, today we conclude our study into the book of Hosea. Now, Hosea preached and he warned Israel about their consistent double-mindedness and their unfaithfulness to Jehovah, and this mainly was by means of disobedience to the terms of the covenant of Moses. Now, using primarily the metaphor of human marital unfaithfulness, adultery, Hosea convicts Israel of the same type of unfaithfulness to God, which in the spiritual realm is called idolatry. Now Hosea's message, which was written and given over around a 35 year span of time, took place as the northern kingdom of Ephraim, Israel's prosperity and security was declining at an ever accelerating pace. Israel's constant wars with their brother kingdom to their south, Judah, led to Israel's kings doing the wrong thing in seeking political alliances with the region's two superpowers, Assyria and Egypt. For 13 chapters of his book, we have witnessed Hosea bring God's message of condemnation to Israel for their idolatry and disobedience to the covenant. That condemnation included the fact that God would no longer bless Israel with prosperity and security, and in fact He has become Israel's enemy. Further, even though the call was to repent and to change their behavior, it was that Israel needed to prepare for the catastrophe that was soon coming. And what was coming, judgment, would not be delayed, it would not be modified, no matter how much Israel might sincerely, sincerely beseech God for His mercy. In response, Israel doubled down in their efforts to secure favor from their pagan neighbors, especially from Assyria. God called this an act of treachery, and He made it clear that no matter who Israel might ultimately make a treaty with, it didn't matter, because Jehovah was Israel's God, and therefore no one could oppose what He had determined to do. Israel couldn't save itself, and the only means of their salvation, Yahweh, was blocked shut. Their doom was certain. However, now, in the 14th chapter of Hosea, Israel receives a message of love and of hope. Rescue and restoration would indeed happen for them, but only in the future. Many generations removed from Hosea's era. The recipients of that mercy would come to the distant descendants of Ephraim Israel, and it would happen in the end times. So, Let's reread Hosea chapter 14. Open your Bibles to Hosea chapter 14. We're going to read it all. Hosea chapter 14. Shomron, that's Samaria, Shomron will bear her guilt, for she has rebelled against her God. They will fall by the sword. Their little ones will be dashed to pieces, their pregnant women ripped open. Return, Israel, to Adonai your God, for your guilt has made you stumble. Take words with you and return to Adonai. Say to him, Forgive all guilt except what is good. We will pay instead of bulls the offerings of our lips. Asher will not save us. We will not ride on horses. We will no longer call what we made with our hands our gods, for it is only in you that the fatherless can find mercy. I will heal their disloyalty, I will love them freely, for my anger has turned from him. 
I will be like dew to Israel. He will blossom like a lily, strike roots like the Lebanon. His branches will spread out. His beauty be like an olive tree, and His fragrance like the Lebanon. Again, they will live in His shade and raise grain. They will blossom like a vine, and its aroma will be like the wine of the Lebanon. Ephraim will say, What have I to do any more with idols? And I, I will answer and affirm him. I am like a fresh green cypress tree. Your fruitfulness comes from me. Let the wise understand these things. Let the discerning know them. For the ways of Adonai are straight, and the righteous walk in them. But in them sinners stumble. Now we studied the opening verses of this chapter last time. Now these verses are essentially introducing a prayer that the exiled in times ten tribes of the northern kingdom will pray, and next comes the good news that God will answer and He will accept them back. Now verse 3 opens with the awkward instruction for Israel to take words with you. At least this is awkward to modern Western ears. The Hebrew word that is being translated to words is Deborim. Now Deborim indeed correctly translates to words. What words is it that Israel is to bring? Now first we must be informed that when Israel brought their sacrifices to the Lord at the temple, they necessarily had to be accompanied with obedience, a contrite heart, and prayer. That is, from the negative viewpoint, sacrifices are worthless without obedience and contrition. Yet, from another more positive angle, if Israelites were obedient in the first place, there would be no need for sacrifices of atonement in the second place. Pretty logical, isn't it? This, you see, though, was not a new thought. In 1 Samuel 15.22, Shmuel, Samuel, said, Does Adonai take as much pleasure in burnt offerings and in sacrifices as in obeying what Adonai says. Surely obeying is better than sacrifice, and heeding orders than the fat of rams. See, the same thought, the this, this, this same pattern of voluntary obedience being better than the consequent sacrifices was entrenched in Israelite society, as we see demonstrated in the Gospel of Mark, where a Torah teacher is responding to Yeshua. So in Mark 12, verses 32 and 33, we hear this. The Torah teacher said to him, said to Yeshua, Well said, Rabbi, you speak the truth when you say that He is one, and that there is no other besides Him, and that loving Him with all one's heart, understanding, and strength, and loving one's neighbor as oneself means more than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. So just as we must never buy into the long-held but faulty church doctrine that grace has replaced law, but rather they are to work together, hand in glove. So it is that obedience and sacrifice are not mutually exclusive, but rather they too are to work together, hand in glove. But now secondly, what exactly are the words that are to be taken with each Israelite as they sacrifice? Well, we begin by recalling that this is an end times prophecy, an occurrence. I can only assume that here the term Debrim, words, means prayer. And considering that verses 3 and 4 are 
the end times prayer to be prayed, then it must surely be that this is referring to that particular prayer, kind of a more ancient Israelite version of the Lord's Prayer model. Now Numbers 14.20 and Jeremiah 14.10 use the word Devarim to indicate prayer. So there is precedent for that. So the first part of verse 3 is an instruction to end times Israel to sacrifice and to pray this prayer model as part of their repentance. Now we covered this a little bit last week, but it bears repeating, because the principle has not changed over the centuries. So it applies to we modern day believers in Yeshua just as much as it applied to Israel. It is that for the most part in the Bible, to repent is as much about changing our thoughts as it is about changing our behavior. Changing our behavior. Our works, our actions, our deeds are defined as the fruit of our faithfulness. And God demands that this fruit appear as evidence of our sincere trust in Him. Our fruit is not what we feel in our hearts. It is not the belief we have in Christ. Rather, it is that an active belief that we have in Christ ought to produce good fruit righteous behavior. If, if that belief is real and sincere. So our bad behaviors are to be replaced with our good, our righteous behaviors, bad fruit, replaced with good fruit. In relation to what God is demanding from Israel, it is that Israel must stop sacrificing wrongly, which is disobedience, and instead it must sacrifice properly. <clears throat> proper sacrifice begins with a proper attitude and with proper prayer. But even more, in the Holy Scriptures to return to God always, always, always means to return to the ways of the Torah. The ways of the Torah are mostly expressed in the Law of Moses, and the Law of Moses is mostly a God-given code of morality that instructs us about our actions and our deeds and our behaviors, including our worship practices, that necessarily come from a changed attitude and renewed mind that directs our desire to be obedient to God. The second half of verse 3 presents the prayer of repentance, and it begins with, Forgive all in iniquity and accept what is good. Ponder on those words. Okay, those words are a little cryptic and they require some explanation, so I'd like to substitute for these words the thought of what they mean to modern ears. It's this, Forgive us, Lord, for our many sins, and see our new righteous behavior as payment for our past bad behavior. Now this falls in line with what we find in the book of Ezekiel about what true repentance is and about how God looks upon our behavior. Ezekiel 3, verses 17 through 21. Human being, I have appointed you to be a watchman for the house of Israel, and when you hear a word from my mouth, you are to warn them for me. If I say to a wicked person, you will certainly die, and you fail to warn him to speak and warn the wicked person to leave his wicked way and save his life, then that wicked person will die guilty, and I'll hold you responsible for his death. On the other hand, 
If you warn the wicked person and he does not turn from his wickedness or his wicked way, then he will still die guilty, but you will have saved your own life. Similarly, when a righteous person turns away from his righteousness and he commits wickedness, I will place a stumbling block before him. He will die. And because you failed to warn him, he will die in his sin. His righteous acts, which he did, will not be remembered. And I will hold you responsible for his death. But if you warn the righteous person that a righteous person should not sin, and he doesn't sin, then he will certainly live. Because he took the warning. And you too. You too will have saved your life. Now, I can't reiterate it strongly enough. God defines sin. Please hear this. God defines sin according to what we do. It's according to our behavior. And our behavior is the outward display of our inner spiritual condition. Therefore, to repent means to phys physically and tangibly turn to the ways of the Lord, to the Torah. And the ways of the Lord inherently mean good behavior. This principle has frankly become all but lost in institutional Christianity, and especially within the evangelical branches that stress grace as a universal perpetual get-out-of-jail-free card that has no connection to our behavior. And the implied doctrine that goes along with it is that our fruit is how much or how little we feel a warmth towards God, and perhaps towards people in our hearts. That's far from how the Bible describes the principle of repentance. Therefore, what the final words of verse 3 are saying, which is also in line with what Ezekiel said, is this. If one changes his or her behavior for the better, in God's eyes, and the bad behavior the person formerly had been exhibiting is ignored when it comes to blessings and curses, rewards and punishment. On the other hand, if a person who had been exhibiting good behavior turns to bad behavior, then his or her former good behavior can also be ignored. I shouldn't have to, but, but let me make this clear. By no means am I suggesting that if we behave well, we have no need for salvation in Christ. Nor is one a replacement or a substitute for the other. Both are expected by God. Righteous behavior is the expected outcome from accepting Jesus' sacrifice as atonement for our bad behavior. Now, essentially, the prayer words at the end of verse 3 are an acknowledgement that sacrifices are pointless unless the altar is approached with a proper attitude and intangible obedience. I'm going to say this another way. The prayer beseeches God to accept good behavior and proper prayer from a contrite heart as a substitute for animal sacrifices. It's interesting that buried in the traditional liturgy that's recited on the Jewish Day of Atonement proceedings, we hear these words, we are permitted by God to offer prayers instead of sacrifices. Kind of interesting. And I want to offer something I can't prove, but I do think it's so. I believe those prayer words here in Hosea are intended, intended to comfort exiled Israel, who will believe they must always live in their sins without hope, remedy, 
or atonement because they are away from the temple and the altar in Jerusalem, and therefore they have no means to restore fellowship with God through sacrificing. Now, in so many ways, this is actually preparing them for their Messiah, who will remedy this problem for them as he becomes their once-for-all sacrifice for sin. Thus, what God will need from them is trust and faithfulness in the Messiah, and no further sacrifice for sin is needed. In verse 4, continuing this future in times prayer of contrition, Israel promises three things. First, they will not seek alliance with Assyria's God, they will not rely on their military for deliverance, and third, they will no longer create or worship idols and images. Now in the future, Israel will say that Asher will not save us. It does not say that Assyria, uh, that Assyria will not save us. Asher is a pagan god the national god of Assyria. So from the 30,000 foot view, the meaning is that a pagan god, a false god, cannot possibly be Israel's deliverer. Promising that they, Israel, will not ride upon horses, this is referring to chariots. Rashi offers that riding uh, offers that the riding on horses automatically connects Egypt to Israel, in that Egypt was the source of horses for Israel's military. Therefore, the idea being expressed is that Israel proclaims that they will no longer rely on that which is supplied by Assyria or Egypt, and that the specific help Israel was hoping for was help from Assyria's God and from Egypt's provision of horses for Israel's military. What is interesting is that this practice of getting horses from Egypt for military use was yet another covenant violation in Deuteronomy 17.16. However, he is not to acquire many horses for himself, or have the people return to Egypt to obtain more horses, inasmuch as Adam and I told you to never go back that way again. Now, the new JPS version of the Bible translates that third promise the most literally, and it says this Nor ever again will we call our handiwork God. See, this statement, while in its widest scope certainly includes idols, is really about those human-crafted golden calf images that Ephraim Israel said were representations of Jehovah. Once again, reminding you that this prayer of repentance belongs in the mouths of end times members of the Northern Kingdom, the Northern Tribes, then it is easier to grasp that Ephraim Israel and the several generations that are going to be born in exile will be subject to the curse that is described in the Torah, but then later on, in God's mercy, Israel will obtain his blessing. Now listen carefully to these words of Deuteronomy that were written at least 500 years, probably a little more, before Hosea was written. These words are preceded by God warning Israel what will happen when they become disobedient and begin committing idolatry in Deuteronomy 4, verses 27 through 31. Adonai will scatter you among the peoples, and among the nations to which Adonai will lead you away, you will be left few in number. There you will serve gods which are the product of human hands, made of wood and stone, which can't see, hear, eat, or smell. However, from there 
you will seek Adonai your God, and you will find him if you search after him with all your heart and being. In your distress, when all these things have come upon you in the Acharit Hayamim, you will return to Adonai your God and listen to what he says. For Adonai your God is a merciful God. He will not fail you, destroy you, or forget the covenant with your ancestors which he swore to them. Notice how in verse 30 it says that in the Acharit Hayamim, the, the world to come, in other words, the end times, that Israel will return to Yehovah. That is, they will return to the ways of the Torah. This is what we are reading about in this end times prayer here in Hosea. Now the final words of verse 4 speaks of it being only in the God of Israel that the fatherless, in other words orphans, find mercy or pity. In the West especially, we can, we can be a little blind to the reality that in the first century there were no such things as orphanages, nor was there governmental foster care or welfare or child protective agencies, or anyone to protect their rights. Orphans were in a very bad way. And their survival and possibility of any kind of a reasonable life depended on the pity of someone stepping forward. Thus, such an act of mercy of an individual towards an orphan was seen as among the highest virtues for an Israelite. So this statement at the end of verse 4 is phrased in an Israelite 8th century BC cultural way to attribute to God's character the highest of virtues in that no human can match such great mercy. The kind of great mercy He is so graciously giving to Israel, which will soon themselves, they will become kind of an orphan. Because their God, their Heavenly Father, is abandoning them. Verse 5 says that after future Israel offers this prayer of true repentance, and after Jehovah graciously accepts it as actual repentance, Israel's former abundance will begin to return. Three metaphors of nature are used to describe God's setting His anger against them aside, and instead of healing them of all their curses for all those covenant violations. The dew describes an abundance of water that makes plants grow almost without limit in a lush environment. Blossoming like the lily speaks of Israel's flowering beauty before God. Casting roots like the trees of Lebanon speaks of the, the strength and the stability that will characterize the people and the nation of the future Israel. This third metaphor about the roots of trees in Lebanon continues on verse 6. The forests and plant life of Lebanon in that era were, were legendary in ancient times, akin to a Garden of Eden. And when we think of the Middle East, so much of it is a dry, barren land of sand, just as it was in Bible times. So it's easy to imagine how the people of those Bible times in this large region of infertile and unproductive landscape would be so overwhelmed by the beauty and the abundance of Lebanon that it became the object of myths and poems as it was seen as very near heaven on earth. Now what Jehovah had promised the refugee rabble coming up out of Egypt so long ago would be a land all of their own of milk and honey so long as, there's that if again, they were obedient to the covenant of Moses. 
but in the future it will be reinstated and the promise made even more grand. It's not unlike it's not unlike the incredible glory of the earth upon creation that quickly went into disrepair when the sin of the first couple squashed perfection. But yet, we are promised in the prophets that there will be a recreated universe and earth that will surpass the magnificence of the first. Is that a hallelujah? And in both cases, the Lord doing this in His mercy for a rebellious humanity that has so disappointed Him and ruined what He had first given to them, to us all, and doing this in an unapproachable act of love. What a great God we have. Verse 8 begins with speaking of Israel, assuming that's who the they is, as living under His shade or alternatively under His shadow. Now, the Hebrew word that is being translated as, as, as shade or, uh, or a shadow is tzel, tzel, and it can mean either one of these things. Very likely though, the better translation to English is shade, because the expression to be in someone's shade is meant as being placed under the protection of someone who's more powerful. Usually this expression referred to kings or to aristocratic patrons. Here's an example, Judges 9.15, the thorn bush replied, If you really made me king over you, then come and take shelter in my shade. But if not, let fire come out of the thorn bush and burn down the cedars of the Lebanon. Another example, Ezekiel 3.16, uh, rather 31.6, 31.6. In its boughs all the birds of the air had their nests. Beneath its branches all the wild animals give birth to their young. All the great nations lived in its shade." So you see what it means. Now there's other examples, this ought to suffice to make the point. So this is speaking of God offering the ultimate protection for His now battered people. Living in His shade means no one can harm them without His permission. And considering what exiled Israel has been through for these past 2700 years, this has to be such a welcome promise for the, those who are of the ten tribes who are today, as I speak, being welcomed back home into the land they were exiled from in the 8th century BC. It is said that Israel will blossom like a vine. Now exactly how we are to picture that isn't clear, except that it is part of a string of agricultural metaphors that were meant to strike wonderment and delighted awe into the hearts of the Israelites. So in reality, no further explanation is needed for these poetic words. The same can be said for the pleasing aroma that comes from the wine of Lebanon, with the idea being that whatever agricultural product that comes from Lebanon, it is the ultimate in quality and quantity, and so this describes what the land of Israel is also going to be like. Well, verse 9 has God placing a rhetorical question into Ephraim's mouth. It's this, why would I have any more use for idols? See, all the things that the gods of the pagan idols Israel had relied on for so many years, for fertility, for security, for rain, Israel now realizes that it was actually Jehovah their national god that was doing the providing. Jehovah is confirming to Israel that only by giving up their idolatry can this promised restoration occur. The two things are linked. They're linked. No matter how many times 
God used prophets to remind Israel of that fact. Israel continued to give credit and glory to the Baals for their prosperity. But in the future, Israel will acknowledge that they know exactly where their blessings come from. And so they will have no need for pagan gods and for idols. Therefore, Israel responds to all of God's wonderful promises of merciful restoration by saying that they will humbly accept them and they liken God to a big green cypress tree. Now this connects back to verse 8 and God providing Israel with His shade. So Hosea's message is one of Israel's redemption history. And it's a reminder of who they are. They are the descendants of Jacob. Their history is one of blessing, then curse, that will be followed by a future new era of blessing. This is the very definition of restoration. Israel has received their warnings from Hosea by reminding them what the terms of the covenant of Moses contained. Terms for them to be blessed, terms for them to be cursed. See, the thing is, Israel has forgotten the covenant of Moses, and instead they adopted man-made traditions and worship practices, so they know nothing of these blessings and curses. Each curse in the Torah is carefully defined as to what it's going to entail, and it is connected to exactly which covenant term was broken. Now, just as no specific time frame has been laid out for Christ followers to know when our Messiah will return, so in Hosea, no specific time frame has been laid out to know, first, how long this curse and punishment is going to go on, and two, when that time of restoration will occur. That hope can live and survive only in the faith and the trust that it will happen, even though it may take centuries to come about. Ephraim Israel was given no hope, no hint that their restoration would occur in their lifetime. Any more than we believers today are given any hope or hint that the return of our Savior will occur in our lifetime. So, if the time frame for these things is so distant, so indefinite, why would ancient Israel, why would we be told about them in such an urgent manner? In a word, preparation. Preparation. Israel was given, and we have been given, time to prepare our minds, time to repent, and time to prepare our lifestyles and our pantries. Yet, since we don't know the time frame, then to assume that it won't be tomorrow is actually quite foolish. We must prepare now, today. Part of the process of repenting for Israel was to seek their true God, to understand that God's divine mercy and blessing cannot be purchased with material things. They would still need to come forward with sacrifices and offerings, but these were to be accompanied with or even preceded by sincere words that Hosea describes as the fruit of their lips. Now, doing this is what God accepts as repentance and nothing less. Repentance is a combination of a change of mind and a change of behavior. One without the other is simply not acceptable to Yehovah. 
Not then, not now. See, it's critical. It's critical that we keep in mind that this restoration for Israel is entirely coupled to the end times. And so whatever we understand about the end times directly affects both believers and Israel. We're in this together, folks. The term the Bible uses for this new age is the kingdom of heaven. Something that Yeshua said was near. Prepare. Believers and followers of Yeshua, I want you to pay close attention to the final verse, verse 10 of this final chapter of Hosea, because it is every bit as much for us as it was for ancient Ephraim Israel. Stuart aptly calls this verse a challenge to the wise reader. I want us to reread it. Take a look at Hosea 14.10, final verse of Hosea. It says this, Let the wise understand these things. Let the discerning know them. For the ways of Adonai are straight, and the righteous walk in them. But in them sinners stumble. The, the RSV puts it this way. Whoever is wise, let him understand these things. Whoever is discerning, let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the upright walk in them, but transgressors stumble in them. This is a fully encapsulated thought that operates much like what our Bibles put as either chapter 13, verse 16, or chapter 14, verse 1. We discussed that in our last lesson. I see it very much as a proverb. It's a wisdom saying. I suspect that Hosea had Psalm 107 in mind when he wrote these inspired words. Listen to Psalm 107, 43. Let whoever is wise observe these things and consider Adonai's loving deeds. Now, fellow believer, do you consider yourself wise? If you're not sure, would you like to become wise? Then the solution is to understand the message of the prophet Hosea. This entire book is about Israel turning away from the ways of God and God specifically addresses what and where these ways of His, these ways of God, are set down and enumerated, going all the way back to Hosea 4.6. My people are destroyed for a want of knowledge. Because you rejected knowledge, I will also reject you as priest for me. Because you forgot the Torah of your God, I will also forget your children. The ways of God are set down in the covenant of Moses. So, the book of Hosea uses the various commandments of that covenant as the reasons for Israel's punishment, that is, banishment from their land. The ways of God are still the covenant of Moses. That has never changed despite institutional Christianity insisting that Jesus changed it. Jesus himself forcefully denies that such a change ever occurred in a passage that most of you are already familiar with, Matthew 5, 17 through 20. Don't think that I have come to abolish the Torah or the prophets. We end it right there, and that ought to do it. But he goes on, I have come not to abolish, but to complete. Indeed, I tell you that until heaven and earth pass away, not so much as a uterus stroke is going to pass from the Torah, not until everything that must happen has happened. So whoever disobeys the least of these commandments, and they teach others to do so, 
They're going to be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever obeys them, whoever teaches them, will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Because I tell you, unless your righteousness is far greater than that of the Torah teachers and the Pharisees, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, when in Hosea 14.10 we next encounter the words, For the ways of the Lord are right, and the upright walk in them, knowing that the ways of the Lord directly means the Torah, then it simply means that knowing and obeying the Torah is how one walks in righteousness. This is not complicated. Douglas Stewart, that conservative Christian Bible scholar, completely agrees with this notion, by the way. In his highly esteemed and often quoted commentary on the book of Hosea, he says this, The ways of Yahweh are, in fact, covenant stipulations of the Pentateuch. It's just another word for the Torah. For the righteous to walk in them is nothing other than for them to keep them. On the other hand, as say the final words of Hosea's book, but transgressors stumble in them. Not to stumble, of course, means to disobey. Disobey what? The Torah. To disobey the terms of the covenant of Moses. To be wise means to obey the covenant terms. In contrast, to be a transgressor is to disobey the covenant terms. It's just that simple. Just as that principle applied to ancient Israel, it also applies to modern-day believers who have been joined to Israel's covenant by means of our trust in the work of our Savior, Yeshua, on the cross. The implication is that if it is wisdom to seek, learn, and do the law of Moses, that it is foolishness not to. Foolishness. What we have here is nothing less than the governing dynamic of God that is intended for all humanity. To continue quoting Stuart, the words of verse 10 serve as a reminder to readers of all generations that Hosea's message continues as a message for them, for us. The words are not simply directed to his contemporaries, thus being of no more than arcane interest to us. Rather, the ways of Yahweh are a guide to the righteous and a source of understanding to the intelligent of all successive periods. This concludes the study of the book of Hosea. Help support God's people by purchasing items made by them. Merchandise with a meaning, products with a purpose. HolyLandMarketplace.com For more teachings, visit, support, or donate at TorahClass.com Join with us in worship and enjoy God's Word at Seat of Abraham Fellowship.